Thanks for joining us and welcome to this session entitled Staying Clean and Compliant During COVID. Your speakers today are Anthony Myony of Smart Inspect and Julianne Steindler of Platinum Cleaning. Take it away. Hi everyone, welcome to Staying Clean and Compliant During COVID. I'm Julianne Steindler, but everyone calls me Jules, and I work for Platinum Cleaning and Facility Services. I um, really love cleanliness. It almost is my passion. And I have three young children at home and really care a lot about things being clean. I'd love to introduce you to my co-presenter, Anthony Mayoni. Tony, take it away. Thanks, Jules. Hi, everybody. Anthony Mayoni here. I go by Tony. Uh, I'm the president with Core Management Services and our app Smart Inspect. We are a consulting company that focuses on only cleaning and environmental services consulting. And since the mid 90s, we've worked with about 2 billion square feet, uh, performing all kinds of services like quality audits, uh, scope of work design, staffing workloads, and other kinds of cleaning and environmental technology. Uh, like Jules said, we're, we're both very excited for today's talk. And um, similar to Jules, I, I also am a family man. I have uh, five young kids at home, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this from the office today. So thanks, Jules. I'll pass it back over to you. So the agenda for our talk today is to give you a, a quick overview um, for environmental services and the general department, and then really focusing in on staying clean and compliant during COVID um, by building a strong foundation, strategies and technology specifically for COVID, and then considering what comes next. Next slide. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction of our topic today, and then we're gonna move into the first portion of our presentation. Um, so as, as Jules mentioned, uh, the, the focus of today is staying clean and compliant during COVID. And through our consulting work, it's a question that we are, uh, that, that we are hearing from our, our customers in the industry almost nonstop in that you know, up to this point, cleaning has always been important, but um, in today's environment, people are seeing environmental services more as a, almost a life and death um, uh, service that needs to be optimized to meet today's demands from the pandemic. And so what we're gonna be talking about today are some tips and best practices on how to stay clean and compliant uh, throughout this pandemic, but also throughout any kind of um, health scare or communicable disease outbreak, whether it even just be the normal flu or uh, future, um, you know, future scenarios that, uh, that may arise. And one of the reasons why you know, we thought it'd be interesting to pick this topic is because there's really been a paradigm shift in the cleaning industry right now. Um, up until this point, it's really been sort of the healthcare or hospital industry that has seen cleaning in, this, in the sense of um, a focus on both the invisible and the visible, but now the rest of the of the world and all under other industries are really focused on that invisible element of the cleaning process. Um, you know, it has to go beyond just finding dust or carpet spots or debris on the floor. Now everybody's talking about you know disinfecting, sanitizing, uh, not just removing the dirt, but killing the germs and pathogens on a surface. And this can be a difficult shift to make, uh, especially for you know, those of us that may be um, considered cleaning uh, in, in the original fashion that I mentioned as being more of a visible problem. You know, we might need to think about new tools, new equipment, uh, new processes to work on, uh, new protocol to administer. And our job today is we're going to be, number one, showing you how to make sure you have a strong foundation for your program, because you really can't implement these next level ideas until the foundation is strong. Then the middle part of our presentation will focus on uh, strategies and technology specifically for COVID. So kind of taking that foundation and moving it to the next level. And then Jules will wrap up with the third final phase to talk about next steps and the future. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna launch the first element of our presentation, which we're calling step one. And that's building a strong foundation for your environmental services program. In this portion, you'll hear Jules and I go back and forth between seven or eight high level topics that you wanna make sure your program has uh, before moving into the next level ideas. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna talk about cleaning specs to begin with here and, and your overall process. Um, really the, the program begins with a defined expectation level or specification. Some people call it a scope of work. Um, in a lot of cases that will involve uh, what we call a task and frequency set. So if you don't already have at least a basic outline of these are the areas of my facility, you know, corridors, resident rooms, restrooms, lobbies, and then these are the tasks that we perform in those areas, vacuuming, dusting, trash collection, and how often, you know, daily, weekly, monthly. Um, if you don't yet have that element, that's something you need to consider. And there's a lot of examples out there. I'm guessing most of you probably already have some semblance of that for your program, but that's really, you know, step one of, of defining a cleaning program and building the foundation. Um, we like to also combine with the task and frequency set some performance criteria and KPIs. So not only do you want to set uh, a standard for frequencies of tasks, you also want to try to define what the outcome should look like. Um, it might be a pass fail threshold that you measure against or uh, a, a really descriptive document of what you want the outcomes to look like of the cleaning process. And we'll talk about some examples of that in a little bit. Um, another element of your program to define early on uh, are your equipment and supplies. Uh, whether you're using you know, microfiber cloths or maybe the more traditional paper towels or cotton, uh, you know, what type of, of vacuums and mops are you using, restorative equipment, that's another critical element that, that, you, that you should have defined as a foundational element. Um, and then finally, some COVID updates to that uh, original base scope of work. Um, you know, common, cleaning of the common touch points, uh, you know, and disinfecting of those touch points is probably the most obvious example that comes to mind up until this point. You know, disinfecting has always been important, but it's been more of a kind of a tangential element of the program, but now it's front and center. And you might even be disinfecting certain touch points every hour. And you need to define who is doing that disinfecting. Is it, um, you know, designated cleaners or um, maybe all the cleaners do a little bit and share that responsibility, or perhaps even the supervisor is somebody that's that's doing that work, um, or, or some some groups are even outsourcing that work to a separate contractor. So that that's another element that you're going to want to define, as well as um, maybe some new chemicals, uh, particularly on the EPA list N, that have shown to be effective against COVID. Um, you know, those might be some new elements that you write into your spec or your scope of work that maybe didn't um, already exist there. So again, cleaning specification, very important. Now Jules is gonna talk about cross-contamination as the next foundational element. Thank you. So when you're talking about best practices for environmental services, it's so important, especially now during the pandemic, to talk about cross-contamination because one of the things that we're seeing, especially in the facilities that we work in, is that um, if we don't have processes in place that are very clear to our employees and to the facility operators themselves, things can get really confusing. So one of the things that we do that I think has been really helpful for everyone is to have a dedicated COVID staff uniform. So in all the facilities that I talked to recently, everyone has it set up like a pod. So you have your red or, or, or color-coded zones, if you will. So um, red zone is where you have COVID positive patients in, in a specified um, kind of taped off area. And then you have a yellow zone um, or a different kind of transitional zone. And then you have a green zone for the healthier standard patients that don't require the level of care um, that are in the other zones. So one of the things that I think is a good idea is to have special um, uniforms for the staff members that are working in each area, so as to make sure that everyone can be accountable for their um, designated area and to make sure that no one kind of goes out. So everyone who works in the COVID unit cannot be free to walk around the rest of the facility. They need to just stay in the red zone. So by wearing a uniform, you can really identify who's working in that zone and so on and so forth for the other zones. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is deep disinfection before and after room transitions are really important, more so than the regular the deep cleanings that your staff is doing every single day. Um, you know, usually in our programs, we're cleaning two to three deep cleans a day without COVID. 
that's just standard practice for our company. However, I know that during COVID, those deep cleans are going to take longer, especially before and after a room transition, because you're going to need to get every single little spot of surface wiped down to prevent cross-contamination into the yellow or green zones of the facility. And then lastly, um, the most important thing I would say is PPE. At the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a lot on the news about running out of PPE, and now companies all over. Every single person I know has talked about how they know someone who sells PPE. It's a whole new market out there. Um, it's not hard to get anymore. The most important thing is having your um, stock and supply really on hand, not just for the nurses who are properly equipped and your therapeutic staff, but for your EVS team, especially those that are working in the COVID positive unit, they need to have the full gear as the nurses and they need to make sure to be protected not only for themselves so that you have a reliable team to, that's going to come into work every day, but also to protect the patients from these staff members who are going out of the facilities and interacting in their communities. Um, the best way, I think, to approach you know, changes in your environmental services during COVID and even beforehand, but I'm just very specifically for Corona, is to make sure that your team is accountable. Who are they accountable to? And how are you um, kind of monitoring accountability? So by using special tools and methodologies, you can really set yourself up for success. And since Tony is the master of accountability tools, I'm gonna let him talk a little <laughs> bit about it now. Yeah, thanks Jules. And actually one, one more thing that came to mind regarding cross-contamination is uh, uh, microfiber. So those of you that have the microfiber cloth system and you're using that for your general cleaning and dusting, um, you know, you might want to think of using, let's say, red cloths for, for toilets and urinals, and then another color cloth for glass, uh, and then maybe another color for uh, sinks or break rooms, just to make sure that you're not using the same cloth and uh, bringing pathogens from one area type or one room into another. Um, and yeah, as Jules mentioned, we're going to switch over to accountability tools, which is the last uh, topic on this slide. Um, and basically, you know, accountability is always important. That's not new for COVID, but with the um, increased risk of your own team, maybe contracting COVID or, you know, like Jules just talked about spreading a pathogen from one room to another, uh, this whole idea of accountability and, and the, the methods that you would uh, make sure that you're following the protocol has been brought to a whole new level. And, um, you know, there's different ways that you can hold yourself accountable and your team accountable. Um, from spot checks that we're going to talk about later to, uh, to training, but you want to think about what kind of tools you're going to use for that. And, you know, at the, at the basic level, you know, it's informal spot checks and, and talking with, um, with the housekeeping staff. Um, but then the kind of the next level up is to digitize it. And, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, an app that you use or another web-based program, there's lots of tools out there like our Smart Inspect app that, will give you the framework to have predefined lists or checklists uh, that you can spot check, you know, PPE or correct disinfectant or chemicals, or uh, even if you're trying to document after you've done a post COVID uh, deep disinfecting uh, process, um, you wanna think about what kind of tools that you would use to do that. Think about the reports that you want those tools to generate, whether it's, you know, pass fail reports or red, yellow, green, or, uh, you know, combining random sampling with more formal spot checks. Um, we like pass fail systems for this, especially for health related audits where you really don't want any gray area. Uh, you want to try to make it very objective so that the criteria is very clear and then um, you're auditing against that criteria and either, either the person or the process is meeting that criteria or they are not. And if they are not, um, tying it into the training program. So we're going to switch to the next slide here, and I'm going to go over uh, a few more best practices. And again, just to bring us back to the high level, we're, we're talking about building a strong foundation, not only for COVID, but just uh, environmental services overall. And so on this slide, we're going to talk about scheduling, performance goals, and reporting. When we talk about scheduling, um, you know, some of the main things we want to focus on here are, are um, the, you know, the disinfecting of the common touch points. Um, so up until this point, some of your disinfecting maybe happened off hours, um, 
but with 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 COVID, and this goes not only for you know this this industry, but you know all the industries that I work in. Um, there's a big focus on daytime presence and, and making those individuals doing the disinfecting of the touch points very visible. Um, you want the residents and the faculty uh, and staff of your buildings to really see and feel that cleaning and disinfecting process in a bigger way than perhaps they did before. Um, you want, you know, they want, you should have them see people wiping the door handles, you know, the elevator buttons, the, the railings, uh, the drinking fountains. Uh, and like Jules said, maybe even designating those people in different uh, uniforms or having them wear a pin or a certain hat uh, that shows that they're doing that surface or, uh, or that specific task. Um, you also want to think about time of day for your quality audits. Um, we recommend doing you know, quality audits and training uh, just in kind of during normal business hours when the occupants of the facility will, will see you doing it, uh, can give you feedback on the fly. Um, can, can share their thoughts of, of how either how you're doing or what their concerns are and that'll help you build your relationship with your customers and, and with your stakeholders. And you got to think of of course who's responsible for doing these audits in this service. Is it uh, you know a supervisor, EVS director, uh, if you're outsourced maybe they have a separate QA quality assurance person come in and do that um, but a lot of times it's a supervisor or lead worker um, or sometimes uh, an occasional administrator. Um, and then from scheduling, we're going to move on to performance goals. I, I touched on this earlier, but you know, you want to you want to give yourself um, a level to strive for with the cleaning and disinfecting program. Um, you know, a task and frequency set, although important, it only goes so far in, in kind of motivating the team and helping you uh, present your successes to uh, administrators. And so, if you can set a target, uh, usually a percentage score out of a hundred. Uh, or maybe if you're doing some higher level testing like ATP monitoring, uh, those have their own thresholds. But that target can define success and, and can give you something to hold either the whole team account accountable for, or some people like to go down to the individual housekeeper or team member uh, and give them targets to strive for as well. You wanna be careful with that in this environment and not make it sort of a, a punitive uh, idea. Um, but sell it as something that you know can promote team building and, and recognize success. Uh, and if anything, if you're falling short of those goals, tie it into additional training uh, and, and attention to those individuals. Uh, then the last point I want to make on, on this slide before we move to the final slide of, of this phase one of our talk is the idea of reporting. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know there, there's lots of different types of reporting. You, you, there's informal reporting where you're just verbally telling somebody something uh, about what you saw. Uh, then the next level up is kind of a basic level of formality with maybe, you know, pen and paper, pen and clipboard. Um, the next level up from that could be, you know, using Microsoft Excel uh, or Microsoft Access or Google Forms to do some basic electronic uh, reporting that would make it easier to email results to others. And then kind of the top level of that hierarchy would be an app or web-based technology. And when you're, when you're thinking about what reports could be best for your cleaning program or your housekeeping program, um, you, should be, you should recognize that the different stakeholders out there um, have different needs. And there's not a one size fits all approach to either the frequency of reporting or the type of reporting. Um, an EVS employee uh, maybe wants more specifics in terms of you know what what they're doing well, how they can improve, maybe some photographic evidence of their areas, whereas uh, maybe an administrator just wants to see a weekly or monthly overall score or report on you know quality by building or by area type or by individual. Um, and you know you should also consider your the the type of setup you have if you're in house. Um, you know it's often where. Uh, you know, maybe the director of environmental services is the one inspecting and sharing reports and data with administrators and to the uh, individual team members. Um, if you're outsourced, you should expect a different kind of reporting, most likely um, kind of informal, maybe weekly reports uh, from what they're seeing, more, more formal monthly, you know, sit downs and, and monthly summaries, uh, and then um, and then kind of a maybe a one and a half hour quarterly business review with your account rep uh, that really walks you through the KPIs, the key performance indicators uh, from that quarter, 
um, and, and can go over, you know, what's working well, what needs improvement, um, and, and then sharing those results with your different team members. So again, the, the takeaway here for reporting or performance goals, customize it for your facility, for your audience, realize that everybody has different needs. And sometimes, you know, using a technology could be the best way to, to do that simply and efficiently. So we're going to go to the next slide here. So and Jules, on, yeah, go ahead, Jules. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so here you'll see at the top of the slide, we're talking about communication and customer focus. Um, so at Platinum Cleaning, I can really just speak to what we do, um, which is that we have a hierarchical system within our operations program in which we have a director of operations, we have area managers, we have on-site supervisors, and those three tiers work together to do our um, inspections and manage our accountability program, all our trainings, and just manage the general um, operation at a specific facility or a, um, you know, at a, you know, string of facilities that are maybe under the same ownership. So um, one of the things that is um, important in talking about communication and you know accountability and all of that is that each facility has a unique need and a very you know very specific setup. So um, I'll just share with you. And one facility that we work in, um, when we first started, the DON was calling the shots. She um, was the person who was giving the orders to EVS, and then we'd have different nurses or different therapeutic service providers also telling our EVS team um, what to do and, and without a ticketing system in place. And then the administrator would tell them what to do. And it kind of was really messy because no one really knew where they took their orders from. So having a communication protocol is almost top priority when you're reevaluating your, um, your EVS setup. So having something really specific to your facility and knowing what your staff um, can do and what their needs are. Um, in terms of reporting, I'll just jump in and say that um, what we do is we actually, we are a little bit more intense with our, um, our reporting than um, other places are. We found that it's really helpful if um, our area managers are coming in um, either weekly if needed or every other week. Our supervisors who are on site, they're doing it weekly. Um, and our director of operations is getting those reports every single week from every person that's doing them. And then um, I think it's about once a month that our director of operations is going into the facility and doing his own reporting. We think that the, the best policy, at least from what our experience is, is that the more eyes that you get into a facility, I mean, right now during COVID, it's hard to get new people into the facility and you really want to like limit the exposure, but the more eyes you get on reporting and inspections, the better because you can really start like seeing um, different perspectives of what's happening. Um, and then we share that with the administrator and if the ownership wants to get involved and they want us to report to them also, we send that information over and we work together. We actually have weekly meetings with our administrators about EVS in order to make sure that on top of everything else, everything is going well because we care a lot about that. And I think it's really important that whoever you use, if it's in-house or outsourced, you really have a solid communication with point people and a ticketing system for issuing um, orders to your EVS system. It's super important. Um, so sharing the results and corrective action plan, we do that by sharing um, our reports with the administrator and giving our recommendations for how we plan to do it, how we plan to correct the actions within our team and what kind of trainings are gonna be put into place. If you're doing it in-house, I really recommend that if you're an administrator listening to this, you really take um, an active role in communicating with your director of EVS and coming up with a system for what, will, what specifically will work for you and um, the way that corrective action will be implemented. And then documenting and celebrating quality wins um, and exceptionally clean areas is obviously what we're all going for. We all wanna celebrate our employees who are doing an amazing job. I'm always seeing on LinkedIn um, that people are celebrating their nurses and it's nurses week and we love our nurses and the nurses are the best thing ever. And I just have to give a big plug and shout out to all the people who work in environmental services. You're risking your lives every single day, going into places during a pandemic, 
You deserve to be recognized and noticed. It is grunt work, it is ugly, and it is messy, and cleaning a toilet during COVID, it's not pretty, and we appreciate you, and we need to make sure that we really appreciate people who are doing a good job. Um, so moving on, um, training and continuous improvement. So there's always gonna be people on your team who need more training, who need to have a little bit more of a urge and push to do better to improve their service. Um, and one of the ways you do that is by making sure your supervisor is on top of it. If they are doing their inspections, they're gonna see who's doing a good job and who's not. And they're going to need to really work hand in hand with those people to improve their, their work. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that when the DOH, Department of um, Health, comes into a facility and they do inspections or they're calling into a facility, sometimes they want to speak to the EVS team. Now, the EVS team is not generally, um, I would say, equipped to have a precise language for which to speak to um, people in uh government agencies. It's, a, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a hard and kind of scary conversation to have, even if it's not a big deal. So I recommend, this is very specific, obviously, during Corona and for the DOH or, or CDC or whoever organization you're working with, to role play a conversation with whoever they're going to need to talk to. So it's going to go something like this. EVS teammate um, A, housekeeper, morning housekeeper. They're going to get on the phone with the DOH. They're going to ask what kind of chemicals they are using to wipe down all the higher um, high touch areas. So you need to make sure that that housekeeper knows the actual proper name of the, of the chemical, the proper touch times and effective times, um, the type of cloth that they're using, hopefully microfiber cloth, and also um, that they know exactly kind of the right answers to, to whatever possible question. So your supervisor, your EBS supervisor or director should be doing that role playing with um, your team um, in the event of a DOH communication. Um, now moving on to when an outbreak occurs, let's say you haven't had an outbreak in your facility for a little while, or you haven't had one at all, God bless you, you are a rarity. Um, in the event that um, an outbreak occurs, you need to retrain your EVS team within 24 hours. I don't care if you train them last week or even yesterday, an outbreak occurs, everyone is going to be nervous. That's just human nature. We all have a little anxiety in front of us. You know, it's something where we're working with. It's so important that your team feels rest, rest, rest assured that you have their back, that you know that they need a little bit more training, that you're going to really you know, pump them up to do a better job. Um, and we recommend that you do that ASAP within 24 hours of an outbreak. Yeah, thanks, Jules. And, and kind of continuing on with training, um, you, know, you really want your training program and the corrective action process to be linked with your quality program. So again, the, the way to make, to make quality not feel like a punitive or uh, a process that makes the team defensive is to uh, um, make training interwoven throughout that process. So um, think about when, when you're doing inspections and doing training, think about the root causes of, what, uh, of any negative outcomes you're seeing. And that goes for whether you're in-house or outsourced. Um, you know, you, this industry sometimes can be known for just kind of picking on and only, and only focusing on what's wrong or what's dirty. Um, but, you know, you really, you really want to get beyond just, you know, panicking about a missed trash can and instead get, get to the root cause of, you know, what, what, what's causing those deficiencies or those lapses that you don't want to see. Uh, and, and then tie that back into your training program to close the quality loop. Uh, and to make sure everybody's continuously improving. Um, so now to finish up this segment one, which is all about building a strong foundation, um, Jules is gonna go through a little case study that gives, an, gives some examples um, of how they've um, kind of used some of these tactics that we just talked about uh, in, in some real world scenarios. And then you'll hear from me again in, in part two. So go ahead, Jules. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk today about a facility in Torrance that we service. Next slide. Um, we started this facility on July 1st, and we um, are using the Smart Inspect app 
to do our inspections. As you can see here on the screen really briefly, this is what it looks like. It's super intuitive and easy to use. And we like it because um, it's on the phone. So whoever's in the facility can like use it right away in real time. So long as your cell phone is charged, it shouldn't be any problem. Um, next slide, please. So what we do with this is that um, an inspector will come into the facility and that inspector will then go through and check out all the different areas. There is a list that they should go through. So it's really easy. Just like go through the list, check it all out, pass, fail. If there's issues where there is a fail, so then they go in and take a picture and explain what, what's wrong with it. Um, you can see to the left, Briefly, this is the reporting that is done. You can see that it's done like score by area, score by building. So you can really get a good sense of what's happening. And thank God we're really happy that most of it is green and it's in the pass rate. There's a, there is always going to be room for improvement. This is a human service industry run by human people, just like you and me, and we are not perfect. So there is always going to be a margin of error. Any company or any person that tells you, yes, I'm going to come in, I'm going to be perfect every day is lying to you. So it's really important to know that there's always going to be some red and you just got to know with it and you got to have the right people, the good supervisor, good, good director to make sure that they are coming in and doing the trainings and also um, celebrating with them with their winnings so they can really see what's going well and where you need improvement. Over here to the left, you're going to see um, this is a report that's done that's really for the supervisor so that you can really get into the nitty gritty of very specific areas, the elevator lobby, the light, the door, the baseboard, kind of everything. And let's say that the baseboard's not clean. You can go over there. They will go in. They will take a picture of it. And then they can show the person who's responsible for that area um, what, what they need to do. Um, and that also just completely reinforces what Tony spoke about earlier, which is that you need to have a scope of work that is detailed and thorough and that every employee in the EBS department knows exactly what their job is. Next slide, please. So you're gonna see here that on the top left, um, on July 24th, our inspector Ryan went into the facility and he started off big. He wanted to see what the large um, kind of issues were in the facility. So you can see here that he went into the janitor, janitor's closet and it was a hot mess. I mean, like, look at this place. It is not functional. It needs shelving, got a dispose of old materials. This is not someone's like the maintenance closet. This is not where the guy who, who installs the lighting keeps his stuff. The janitor's closet is for the janitor and his materials and her materials and, and everything that they need so they know what they have and knows what they need to order. Um, on August 7th, Ryan returned. Ryan returned to the facility and he noticed that things were starting to improve on a high level and he was able to get into the bathroom and see that mats needed to be ordered for under the urinals because they are staining the grout. So after that, we move on to September 3rd. You can see that um, Ryan went back to the facility and he noticed that things were really improving a lot and things were going really well, but he started to get into the nitty gritty, like high dust high dusting needed to be improved at the tops of the tiles um, on the walls of the of the restroom. And then on September 17th, he returned to the facility to um, find out that things are going really well, but the cleaners, um, the janitors who do the, to the, the restrooms, they really need to be more consistent um, with their signing off on their restroom cleaning. So they need to make sure that the times and their signatures all line up correctly. So um, we really love that we were able to see a timeline for how things kind of get narrowed down in different areas of the facility kind of get focused on as we move along. Next slide, please. Yeah, thanks for that case study, Jules. And I'm going to pick up here on, on step two. But just to recap, you know, Jules case study actually made, kind of made the point that you, know, you, you have to start with the foundational elements before you can move to the more advanced you know, strategies and technology for COVID. I mean, you saw how they moved from the basic idea of you know, cleaning the janitor's closet to the more refined items like high-low dusting and you know, checking on the restroom sign-off sheets. And so remember, you know, start with the big ideas like your, you know, your cleaning scope of work, your training program, your quality program, you know, setting the performance goals, avoiding cross-contamination, 
uh, proper communication. You know, they get get those in line first. Make sure that's strong, and now you know you'll be ready to address some of these items in in step two. And we're just going to spend about ten minutes going through this, and then Jules uh, will wrap up with the final phase at the end. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're actually going to go through four strategies within step two. Strategy number one is focusing on common touch points. And we've mentioned these a couple times. Um, but the reason why it's worth such a focus is because you know, studies show that common touch points are where most pathogens are transmitted when it comes to you know, surface to person transmission. Uh, these include items, of course, like door handles, switches, appliances. And you might ask the question, well, you know, at the beginning, Tony, you mentioned that the invisible is important to COVID. So why are we doing visual inspections of common touch points? Well, the answer has to do with the definition of cleaning versus disinfecting. Um, cleaning is the removal of, uh, of dirt, debris, you know, the substance that might be on a surface. That usually in cases you, you can see what you're trying to remove. Um, disinfecting is killing the material on a surface. Um, up to a certain you know percentage of that that's the difference between sanitizing and disinfecting how much you know what percentage you kill so the but but to properly disinfect you also have to clean you, you can't disinfect an unclean surface um, so the idea is that because it's it's difficult to uh, audit the invisible you can kind of do a, a, a an end around or an indirect way of trying to assess if something is disinfected by just doing a visual audit to see if it was cleaned. Um, if, if a common touch point hasn't been cleaned, then you know by definition it could not have been disinfected. So there is still a place, even with COVID or times of a pandemic, uh, to do those visual inspections, focus on the common touch points. Uh, that will give you a pretty good indication if those points are also being disinfected. Um, and then on, on each of these strategies you're about to see, we're going to share some tips some training tips and customer tips. Basically for this one, you know, use this as a moment to teach uh, your staff about the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting, and then teach about you know, the, the importance of common touch points and, and maybe define what those touch points are and at what frequencies you're cleaning and disinfecting them. Next slide, please. All right, now we're gonna get into some more fun strategies and some new technology. Strategy number two, is uh, UV or black light inspection. And uh, what I mean by that, so here, here's my UV flashlight. You can see I'm shining it in my camera here. Um, UV or ultraviolet light, it, it's a kind of light that can reveal certain organic or inorganic matter that can't be easily seen by the naked eye. Uh, some examples of what glows under a UV light are urine, saliva, uh, some bodily fluids or other fluids, blood, uh, some food, food waste, mold, bacteria, uh, fluorescent markers, chocolate syrup actually glows under UV. Uh, but it's important to know if you're doing audits with a UV light, um, this light does not verify the presence or absence of a pathogen. You know, just because you, a surface lights up and glows doesn't mean there's anything particularly good or bad on that surface or dangerous. Um, so don't, don't be fooled into thinking that you know, this proves whether you're, you know, eliminating the, the contamination, but it still is an effective way to get your, your, your housekeeping staff, your EVS staff thinking about the invisible. Um, and so some training tips on, on the use of these would be, um, you know, just, just take an employee into a bathroom and turn the lights off and turn one of these on. They'll usually be shocked at what they see in that restroom or in that break room once you shine a UV light on it of how, how many items that they're, they're not wiping or not getting to in those spaces. And again, you're not trying to catch them or, or come down on them. You're trying to just open their minds to the idea of that, you know, there's an invisible element, particularly with disinfecting. If you go to the next slide, please, uh, we're gonna go over some other examples of this. So um, on the upper left slide there, that's, that's our UV light kit. Um, we have the flashlight plus uh, these glow germ powders and, and, and gels. And basically, you know, the whole kit costs less than $50, but the powder is a great way to train on hand washing. Uh, you can see the photos of my hands there. The one on the left uh, is before I washed my hand. I, I covered it with the, with the powder and shined a uh, light on it. You can see it's glowing. Uh, then the picture on the right is after I washed my hand for 20 seconds with soap and then shine uh, the light on it again. You can see 
that it pretty much removed all the glowing powder, except there is still a little bit uh, around uh, my fingernail or two, uh, which just showed me, you know, that I, I still had some learning to do with, with proper hand washing. So that's a great training tip. Also, the photos on the bottom show uh, a bathroom and a break room that has a daily cleaning and disinfecting cleaning spec. So there's a housekeeper coming in both of these rooms every day, cleaning and disinfecting touch points. And even with that, look at all the different uh, items that I found when I glowed the light on it. Um, on the partition door and on the light switch, you see a little glowing material and those are common touch points. And then you know, on the floor under the urinal and different parts of the break room, uh, you also see uh, some different uh, you know, glowing material. And again, this doesn't mean that there's a disease on those surfaces, but uh, it kind of takes you one step farther thinking about the invisible uh, and, and what could be there. And then you can teach your, your team to do a better job wiping uh, those different nooks and crannies. Uh, next slide, please. So we talked about common touch point audits. We talked about UV light. Now we're going to take it up one more level uh, to ATP meters or ATP monitoring. Um, some of you may have, have seen this before. It, it's Up until this point, it's been common in hospitals and the food industry. But it's basically using one of these kind of devices. You see, this is our meter here. Uh, the Hygiena is a, one of the more popular longstanding brands. Um, so you use a device and then you have a package of swabs. So here's what a swab looks like. Hold it up to the camera. It's kind of like a big Q-tip type thing uh, that you swab on a surface, a hard surface, um, and kind of, you know, you follow the directions and go back and forth different directions. And then uh, once you've done that for the allotted amount of time, you put the swab in the device, close it, and usually within about 15 seconds, it gives you a reading right on the, the main screen of the device. And what it's reading, it's, um, it's measuring relative light units um, that the ATP molecule uh, is, uh, is interacting with. There, there's an enzyme called ATP that is only, it only exists in and around living cells. So basically, you're trying to find out if a surface has anything living on it, which could be, again, good or bad. Doesn't mean that if there's living material or organic material that it's, that it's a pathogen or COVID, but you're at least having a scientific way uh, to measure the amount of organic substance on a surface. And it actually uses a firefly enzyme to react with that, and then it produces that score. Um, your individual ATP unit will tell you what score is passing or failing. And then there's different levels of passing or failing. You know, the, the highest level is if, if you want to be able to eat off the surface or have it sanitized for food, it needs to score under a certain level. Uh, then there's another range that's kind of intermediate and then there's a failing range usually. Um, and there's a lot of common applications with this. Uh, we, we've used it in our office just to uh, train people on um, how dirty their, their smartphones are. Uh, if you swab your, your phone screen versus even like a toilet seat or a toilet handle, your, your phone has way more organic material on it, sad to say. Um, you also might use these devices to uh, train on the efficacy of microfiber cloths. Um, we've done tests where uh, we've swabbed surfaces uh, before and after using a microfiber cloth with only water on it versus a cotton or paper towel uh, with maybe a, a cleaning chemical or disinfectant on it. And hands down, mi microfiber, even with just water, not even a chemical, is much, much, much better at removing the material or organic material uh, from a surface. It's because of the static charge that it has. So it's a great training tool in that regard. Um, it's also a good tool to do, um, you know, kind of check it, whether you're in-house or outsourced, to do before-after tests on different individuals. You know, either, you know, use a fluorescent, uh, I'm sorry, you know, swab a surface maybe before the cleaning event takes place uh, and then wait till the cleaning has happened and then come in and swab that same surface again. And what you're looking to see is that uh, the RLU score decreases from a higher level to a lower level. And if it's not decreasing, then your teammate's probably doing something wrong. Uh, we actually, one of our team members just returned back yesterday from an ATP inspection and a visual inspection. The facility uh, was um, cleaned extremely well, scored a 98% visually, but had a lot of failures from an ATP standpoint. Um, and so again, it's thinking about that invisible element. Next slide, please. 
And then here's just some photos of you know, a typical ATP kit. The downside is that they're uh, pretty expensive and a little harder to find these days. Uh, the whole kit with the swabs could cost around $2,000. Next slide, please. Um, and here's my last point before I turn it back over to Jules. Uh, strategy number four is doing observational spot checks. Again, you could do this informally or, or with pen and paper or with an app or technology, but you're basically um, trying to randomly check PPE, processes, chemicals, uh, equipment, um, you know, uniforms. Um, also make sure people are filling out their, you know, their, their morning questionnaire that they're feeling health, healthy and safe to uh, come into the workplace. Um, again, this is originally born out of food safety and hospital grade cleaning, but it's now permeating um, all elements of, of, of the industry and in buildings and facilities that never really thought to do this before. Um, and, and, and again, you don't want to create a culture of fear or catching people in the act of negligence. Rather, you want to build up your team, help, uh, help the cleaners, janitors, housekeepers feel like you're taking their health and their safety uh, uh, to the maximum level and, and that you're recognizing that, that they're putting themselves at risk and you're, you're just checking to make sure they have the tools and the training they need to do a great job. Um, so just to recap, first part of the talk, foundational elements, you know, getting the, the base in place. We just went over part two which is auditing the common touch points, UV light audits, ATP monitoring or testing, and then finally, observational spot checks. Those are some next level ideas to consider for COVID. And now Jules is gonna jump in here with the final step three. Thank you, Tony. And thank you for that very informative, high level um, inspection protocol. Um, so the real question is, what's next? Next slide. So what's next? Now that you know all of this, and now that you're an expert and you've learned all these things with us today, what do we do now? So listen, the future really does remain uncertain. Oh, sorry, next slide, excuse me. So the future really does remain uncertain. You know, when the vaccine will come out, when, if, there, if and when a third wave will occur, um, occupancy, space configurations, emerging technology, budgets, supplies, how the national economy will impact us, and the list goes on and on. It's imperative to stay proactive and keep an open mind. What are my residents asking for? Me for? What are the patients in your facility needing? Is my program working for me? Some of your administrators, some of your EVS directors and have different roles in the facility. Is your program, your EVS program, really doing the work that it needs to be done and satisfying you? What technology would you like to use? This is so important, especially after what Tony just shared with you. Um, what kind of um, black light or ATP measures, what are you gonna use? Um, and then at the end, what data reports and processing tools are, are not providing value to you right now? Is going around with a pen and paper really tedious? Is just snapping photos on your phone and taking some notes really working for you? Um, is it giving you what you need? And making sure that you adjust that and then some ideas to consider. Lastly, the question is always there, in-house versus outsourcing. Clearly I am biased. However, for the purpose of the education of this program, it's so important that you consider, which is better for your facility right now, is having the control in-house where you are on top of it as an administrator, director of environmental services, are you able to really do what it takes to be on top of that and everything else that's going on in the facility? Or do you need to outsource it to a company that's going to take over all the HR, all the training, all the workers comp, all of the inspections and keeping everyone accountable? Um, those are real questions to ask you and to make sure that your program is the best that it can be. And then the lastly, never let a good crisis go to waste. Tony likes to say that to me and I think it's the most brilliant thing that you can really think about, which is during Corona, don't let the lessons of Corona go to waste. You have this unique opportunity now to run your facility with the best practices and to really fight to make sure that your facility is the cleanest that it can be, not only during a pandemic, but going forward. So thank you so much for joining us. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate um, you listening and participating. 
And um, if you want to get in touch with us, our information is here on this slide, and we'd be delighted to talk with you further. Thanks, everybody.